First off, elasticity simply refers to the responsiveness to change. And when we're talking about demand elasticity, or technically speaking, the price elasticity of demand, we're talking about how responsive is quantity demanded to a given change in price. We know because the demand curve slopes down that when uh, price goes up, quantity goes down. But we want to know how much. And elasticities of demand can be labeled elastic or strongly responsive. That means the quantity changes proportionately more than the price. So if the price goes up by, let's say, 50%, quantity might go down by something like uh, 90%. That would be elastic, strongly responsive. Unit elastic, where price and quantity changes are equally responsive. They change by the same proportion. So if price goes up 20%, quantity goes down by 20%. And then inelastic, quantity is weakly responsive to changes in price. Quantity changes proportionally less than the change in price. So if the price doubles, increased by 100%, quantity might only go down by something like 5 or 10%. Okay, and when we get into the problems, we'll talk about different kinds of goods that have different elasticities. We're talking about elasticity, which is responsiveness to change, or you can think about it in terms of the responsiveness to a force that's acting on an object. In the case of demand for a product, the force is the price change. But uh, let's take something that is uh, elastic that we, that we know about, a rubber band, and the force acting on it will be my hands pulling it apart. So I apply a given force, and the rubber band easily moves. This is highly elastic. I'm applying a very light force with my hands, probably you know, maybe a pound worth of pull, and this thing stretches quite a bit. So that's elastic. It moves a lot in response to a given force. Now something that's not elastic, my ruler. I'm, I'm applying the same force. In fact, I'm, not, I'm pulling probably even a little harder, but I apply the same force and this thing doesn't move at all. This is very inelastic, so it's not responsive to being acted on by a force. So here's something that's inelastic, doesn't really move or change in response to that force. Here's something that's elastic, moves a lot in response to the force. So what's something in between? I'm going to find something that moves just a little bit, but my tie, the fabric will move. If I pull on my tie, same force, it moves a little bit. So this is uh, slightly elastic, but it would, will have a, a low elasticity coefficient. The rubber band would have a high elasticity coefficient, and my ruler would have... Um, a very low to zero elasticity coefficient. Okay, so hopefully you have a good intuitive understanding of what this concept of elasticity means. And let me note before we move on that uh, demand and supply elasticity are completely analogous concepts. So if I jump to the definitions of supply elasticity, everything's the same. And notice I've just changed, I've just, notice I've just replaced the word demand with supply here. Price elasticity of supply is how responsive quantity supplied is to give a change in price. Then we can say whether it's elastic or inelastic. Okay, one more quick definitional item. The concept of measuring elasticity with elasticity coefficients, which we'll start doing in some sample problems in a moment. That's uh, indicated with the Greek epsilon, and that can be either greater than one, which we'll label as elastic officially. Uh, it's equal to one, that's unit elastic, or it's less than one, being inelastic. Let's talk about the formula for elasticity and we'll notice here that there's a problem that could skew the results. So we'll need to make a, a refinement of our formula before we can actually apply it to some problems. The basic formula is really simple. It's just a percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. So we're looking at a, a typical demand curve. Price goes up, quantity goes down. Price elasticity, therefore, is always negative. Price is going up, quantity is going down. That means the numerator is negative. Or if price is going down, quantity is going up. That means the denominator is negative. So price elasticity is always negative. And we typically will talk about the elasticity coefficient just in absolute value terms. So we know it's negative, so we just want we just want to look at the magnitude of it. Okay, and here's a, an example using that, that really simple formula. Price of oil increases by 10%, the quantity demanded falls by 5%, then the price elasticity is with that minus 5%, that's the percentage change in Q, divided by the plus 10% change in P, minus 0.5, or just 0.5, as I mentioned, we use absolute value. Okay, now there's a problem. Let's say this. Let's say you uh, run a website design company, and you know that uh, at a price of two hundred fifty dollars, you could sell eight units per month. At a price of two hundred, you could produce twelve websites per month. Now, how do we calculate elasticity here? Well, as we'll notice, it's going to depend on whether price is going up or down, and therefore quantity going up or down. Now, the problem is the percent change is going to be different depending on where we start. If we start at A and the price goes up 
we'll get one set of percentages. But if we start at B and have the price go down, the quantity up, we'll get a different set of percentages. Specifically, if, we're, if the price is rising from 200 to 250, that would be a change of 50 divided by the base of 200. So that's a plus 25% increase in price. Quantity is going from 12 to A. That's a change of 4 divided by the base of 12. So that's minus 33. So our elasticity in that case is 1.3 which we would label as elastic because the elasticity coefficient is greater than one. However, if we start at B and go to A, price is going down. We see the price change is uh, 50 over 250, which is just 20% now. And the quantity change is plus four divided by eight, which is now 50%. So now our elasticity coefficient is much higher, 2.5. It's almost twice as large, in fact. So uh, we're, we're going to get a skewed result depending on where we start here. So we want a better method that kind of evens out that effect. So what we're going to do is use what's called the midpoint method. And to calculate these percent changes now, we're going to take the difference in price or the difference in quantity. And instead of dividing it by one or the other endpoint, we're going to divide it by the midpoint or the average value. It doesn't matter what end value and start value we use because we're only taking the difference. So we'll get the same result either way. So whether the price is going up, quantity down, or the price down, quantity up, we look at the same elasticity result. So we're going to focus on this midpoint method when we calculate elasticities. And for our little example problem here, our percent change in quantity now is the difference, 12 minus 8 or 8 minus 12, if you will, which is 4, divided by the average, 8 plus 12 divided by 2, which is 10. Or you can just visually think about the midpoint here, right between 8 and 12, halfway between 8 and 12 would be 10. Okay? So our midpoint percent change in quantity the difference, 12 minus 8, divided by the midpoint, which is um, 4 divided by 10, 40%. Okay, now our percent change in P. Likewise, the difference, which is 50, whether we're going up or down, it's $50 change. And the midpoint between 200 and 250 is 225, or if you prefer the average, 200 plus 250, 550 divided by 2 is 225. Okay, so now we've got our midpoint percent change in price. And that's going to work out to 22.2%. Now we calculate our elasticity of demand. Our percent change in quantity, 40, divided by our percent change in price, 22.2. We got a nice midpoint elasticity value of 1.8. Okay, so just to summarize the formulas, our basic elasticity of demand is simply the percent change in quantity divided by the percent change in price. Our midpoint elasticity is the change in quantity divided by the average quantity divided by the change in price, divided by the average price. Likewise with supply, same exact calculations except on the supply curve. So when we're calculating elasticity of supply, we're just looking at the percent change in quantity supply divided by the average quantity supply, the percent change in price divided by the average price. Okay, let's work some example problems now. Okay, so we're starting off with uh, navel oranges and um, You'll notice first off that my price is always in dollars per unit and the pound unit here would be pounds. My quantity is always in units per time period, pounds per week. And I did make up these numbers, but the, they'll be somewhat close to the prices we would actually observe in real markets. So I'm going to start us at a dollar per pound. And at a dollar per pound, we're going to say that this market buys 10,000 pounds per week. I'll just label that 10K. Then we'll have the price fall to 85 cents per pound. And at that price, the sales go up to 16,000 pounds. Okay, now we, we have a segment of our demand curve here. We could kind of draw a demand curve in here. We don't need to, but that's fine. Now let's bring in our equation, percent delta Q over percent delta P. And remember, using the midpoint formula, it's delta Q over average Q divided by delta P over average P. So it's simply a matter of plug and chug now. Our delta Q is 6. Our average Q is just the midpoint between 10 and 16 or 10 plus 16 divided by 2, it's going to be 13. And uh, I don't need to write the zeros in there. I can't. I could if I needed to, but either way, the division problem will be the same. My delta P is 15 cents, and my average P is going to be the midpoint between those, or the average, 0.925. Simply perform the calculations. So the, the numerator is 6 divided by 13, 0.46. We can round this. And the denominator is 0.15 divided by 0 0.925, 0 0.16. Do that, and we work out to an uh, elasticity coefficient of 2.875. Let's call that 2.88. 
And of course, that registers on our elasticity spectrum as highly elastic. And as we might expect with oranges, you know, you've got a lot of good substitutes, other fruits and uh, other food products. So you're not necessarily going to buy, you're not going to get excited about buying oranges until there's a significant uh, decrease in the price. Okay, now another demand elasticity problem. Let's look at the demand for household electricity. And this time we'll make the price go up. It starts at 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour. And at that price, we have uh, 300 kilowatt hours per month demanded. This is maybe for an individual household. The price rises to 8 cents per kilowatt hour. And demand only falls slightly to 290 kilowatt hours per month. And once again, we could kind of sketch in our demand curve there. But what we're interested in is elasticity. So once again, we just want to plug and chug into the formula. The delta Q is a change of 10 kilowatt hours. The average Q would be the midpoint, 295. The delta P is 1.2 cents. And the average Q here, simply 8 plus 6.8 divided by 2. 8 plus 6.8, that's 14.8 over 2, 7.4. Okay, then we work out all this math. We get 0 0.034 divided by 0.16, and that works out to, I'm rounding, 0.21. Elasticity coefficient of 0.21, well, less than one, so we would label this as inelastic, and this would be quite inelastic. You know, it might make sense when you think about home electricity, there's not many good substitutes, and people are going to be willing to pay higher prices to keep their homes lighted and heated, and, and not necessarily cut back that much on electricity use in the short run, even when the price goes up. By the way, I want you to notice that uh, my percent change in price, 16% here, and back in my oranges example, 16%. So I, I did exert the same force, if you will, the same price change. And here we see a rather large quantity change, 46%, for a large elasticity coefficient. And here with the electricity with the, with the same price change, 16%, we saw a very small quantity change, just 3.4% for a very small elasticity coefficient. Okay, now let's think about supply elasticity. I'll stay in the agricultural market. Let's think about potatoes. And it's dollars per pound, pounds per week. And I'll start us off at a price of 25 cents per pound and a quantity purchased at that price of 5 million pounds. And price goes up to 30 cents. Now suppliers, of course, will supply more at higher prices because they can cover higher cost of production. And let's surmise that the quantity goes up to 10 million pounds pounds per week. Okay, we can maybe sketch in our supply curve here, but remember it's the same formula, so we just need delta Q over, over average Q. The delta Q is 5 million, the average Q is 7.5, delta P here is 5 cents, and the average Q, the midpoint between 25 and 30, would be 27 and a half, or 0.275. Okay, so we work all of this out, we get uh, 0.67 on top, divided by 0.18 on the bottom, and that's going to be approximately 3.6, so that's much larger than 1, so we can label this as elastic supply. Okay, let's do one more supply elasticity. Now I'm looking at the supply of uh, three-bedroom apartments in Springfield. So price now is dollars per month, that's the rent, and quantity is in the units offered per month by uh, landlords and apartment complexes. And we'll say that the price starts at thousand dollars a month and at that price in this town landlords offer two thousand units and the price goes up to say twelve hundred and because in the short run the supply of apartments is relatively fixed it's pretty difficult for them to increase supply they might be able to maybe get some units that are being cleaned or repaired and kind of hurry that along and and get the supply up just a little bit so let's say it only goes up to, to 2050 and then we have a supply curve that looks something like that Okay, and we're working with our same formula. Hopefully this is getting pretty routine by now. Change in quantity is just 50. The average quantity would be halfway between 2000 and 2050. That would be 2025. Change in price is $200. The average is going to be the midpoint between here, 1100. And this works out to, you can do this on a calculator, 0 0.0247 over 0.187. And when we solve that, we get 0.136, which is, well, less than 1, a very low coefficient. So we would label this as inelastic 
supply. And again, if you think about the, the constraints on increasing the supply of apartments, uh, it makes sense. It's even if landlords wanted to, in the short run, it's difficult for them to build more buildings. Now, in the long run, we might surmise that the, the supply curve is much flatter and the same increase in price here would yield a much bigger increase in quantity. So we could think about long run elasticity versus short run. Okay, but for now, we're just focusing on calculating that coefficient and uh, getting this formula down. There's a whole world of analysis that this concept of elasticity opens up to us. But it's important to know elasticity of demand and supply to predict consumer or producer responses to price changes. Okay, so here's a nice little chart that helps us review and summarize. And it's often useful to draw the two demand curves that go through the same point. And the rule is that the steeper demand curve is always the more inelastic one. What we have here is the same price change, the $10 price change on this inelastic demand curve causes a proportionally very small quantity change. But on this elastic demand curve, it causes a proportionally much larger quantity change. I'll close with one little hint here. Inelastic demand curves are very steep and they kind of look more like a capital I for inelastic. And elastic demand curves tend to be much flatter and if you kind of draw an uh, extra line in here, you can see that it looks like a capital E for elastic. When I saw this